I had polio, as you said, in 61. I was 17 years old. It was a summer vacation. I enjoyed physical things. I was proud of being able to jump 173 centimeters high. I played the violin in the school orchestra. I liked to dance. And I had gotten interested in girls. And then, after three days, I was reduced to what you could call a vegetable. I was heavily sedated and yeah, I was gone in daydreams. I was in the other lung. In fact, I was lucky because I hardly fit in there. I was six foot two, and had I been six foot three or four, my knees wouldn't have had room, so I, that they would have to give me a trick, which would have been a lot worse for me. The area in the south was the least developed. So hardly anybody was getting the vaccine there. And I was probably among the last cases of that polio. Among my memories from that period, for three months I spent there, I have three episodes. When I got into the island, when I fell ill, it was getting towards the end of the summer. The time when house flies go inside because they're looking for the warmth. So there were flies in the hospital room and that climb on my face, that tickled my nose and that irritated the hell out of me. And I couldn't scare the away of them because my arms were inside the iron lung. And besides, my arms were paralyzed anyway. So one day I had a plan. I waited until the fly would hover on my nose during the machine's negative pressure cycle. And I opened my mouth just in time at the optimum moment and my tormentor was helplessly sucked into my mouth. I squashed the fly with my tongue against the gums and spit the lifeless body out. And that was probably the most fun I had during these three months I spent the iron walk. But looking back at this incident, it did teach me a lesson, I believe. That there was something I could do to improve my situation. Even if it was just the smallest step, I wasn't completely helpless. After all, I killed the fly. I could carry out a plan and I could do things even if I had to do them differently. Yeah, it may take more thinking, it may take more time, but in the end, if I was stubborn enough, I could reach my goal. And I think that's an important lesson. After a couple of months, I realized that my body would never be as before. And I wanted to die. There aren't many ways to kill yourself in your almost completely paralyzed in Ireland. So I started to save the sleeping pills that were giving me every night to help me fall asleep. And I stored them in my cheeks in the hope that I could store enough of them so they would kill me. But unfortunately, the pills were dissolving too fast in my cheeks and there were never enough to kill me. Well, 
looking back, I can only smile at the kid I was at the time. I haven't learned much about life. What it was about and what makes you feel good. I only know, knew that my body was important to me and didn't know that there was more to life than just the body. For, for example, uh, I thought the body was important to impress the girls. But you know, there are so many other ways to win our girls. And you don't need a body to feel good about yourself. There's so much you can do with the brain. And even if you're not bright, you still can feel connected, respected. You still can love and be loved. Life is all about relationships. And for this, you don't need much of a body and don't need much brains. And that also makes me think about when reading about assisted suicide. I would have been a perfect candidate for assisted suicide. I had a weight of 100 pounds, down from 180 pounds. I was paralyzed except for some fingers, unable to breathe on my own. My prognosis was pretty poor. But what a waste it would have been. I would have missed the opportunities that would gradually open themselves up to me. I would have missed so much beauty of this world. All the interesting places I would be able to visit later. I would have missed all the interesting people I've been meeting. I would have missed delving into interesting subjects and I would have missed all the satisfaction from helping out and make my small contributions to make the world a better place, as we all think we do. And I would have missed, of course, friendship and love, my wife and our dear daughter. All of that I would have missed. What a shame it would have been. There was another episode. The staff tried to wean me off the iron lung. That is, I had to learn to breathe on my own again. And that meant building up these neck muscles that pull up my thorax. Because I had no diaphragm and no intercostal muscles that sit between the ribs either. So to wean me off the iron lung, the staff would turn off the lung every day. First for a minute, and then day by day, a few minutes more, depending on the shape I was in that day. And I was up to this because it reminded me of sports. You know, there was something to achieve and there was something to be measured objectively. I liked that. So it was the day when I had reached about 15 minutes of being able to breathe on my own. That was a Wednesday. And Wednesday when the other patients went for physical therapy into the indoor pool. And the day when the staff was extremely busy. It was a young Austrian nurse that turned the machine off and she promised to return very soon, but she didn't. I breathed and breathed, and soon I had already passed my previous record, and still she hadn't come. I was getting concerned. I tried not to get panicky as I was getting more and more tired with each breath. I had an alarm, a button in the lung next to my finger, 
and that one I pushed. And so did Alois, my roommate, who was also in an iron lung. And we tried to make noises with mouth and lips. You can do like this. But the door out to the room was closed and nobody could hear us. And I don't remember what I was thinking. But anyway, somebody did come and turn the machine on. And by that time, I was blue in the face and I had passed out. And isn't that interesting? Just a couple of weeks before that, I was ready to kill myself. And now I fought for my life until literally blew in the face. And that showed me that deep down, I wanted to live after all. That life was worth living and too precious to be thrown away. From then on, I was interested in living on and making the best out of my situation. That's what I like to think. I've heard many people say that this is just like returning to the womb. It's warm, it's comfortable. You get a lot of air. It's a fantastic oxygenization. So th this is very positive. And there are some people who don't work it out. I mean, I've heard of people who have been staying in the Iron Lung for decades, despite the fact that they could have had nose masks. You hear the soft swish of the air coming in and out. It makes you fall asleep. So that's a powerful experience. And, you know, you heard very positive terms. But of course, on the other hand, if you don't want to sleep, then it's kind of boring. Because there's much else to do. Okay, I was reading, but that meant my head is flat. And above my head was a translucent plastic piece attached to the lung. And on top of that, upside down, people would put the book but after reading those two pages, somebody had to come and turn pages. There wasn't always somebody there. In fact, there was a very seldom somebody there to turn the pages. And automatic page turners or that kind of stuff and technology compared to today wasn't there. So it was boring. And when somebody came and visited me, they would always look down on me. And I didn't like that. I was six foot too tall. So I was used to looking down on other people. A very primitive kind of one-upmanship. Well, of course, you could draw a karmic conclusion saying that that just teaches you right. Now we know what it means to be looked down on. Eating was also difficult because somebody had to feed me. Somebody brushed my teeth, and that was horrible. Most of the staff were nuns. So the nun would come in the middle of the night at six o'clock, white in the face, pale, because she always worked at nights. And then she mumbled something about that I had been chosen and had received special grace to sort of do time already in this world and not having to do time in the next world, which in those days I believed in, because it was a comfort. So while she was mumbling, she was fumbling around in my mouth with a toothbrush. And since then, I really enjoy brushing my teeth myself. And my family consisted at that time of my mother. My sister had already moved out and parents. So my mother and I were living in our house and she would 
moved to Munich to be closer to me where I was in the hospital. So she could visit me daily, which was a pain to me for two reasons. One, I wasn't doing well and didn't want to show her how bad I was off. And at the same time, I realized that I made her feel bad with the way I was. So it wasn't good for both of us. At the same time, she helped me out with a lot of things. Like she would turn the pages of the book. She would bring me food, that kind of stuff that mothers do. My sister had just gotten her children. So she was very busy. She was also living almost an hour's drive away. So she couldn't come that way off. I had a cousin in Munich and his parents, and they'd come once in a while. Otherwise they didn't have hardly anybody there who could visit me. So I was pretty isolated. That had an effect on me. After I've been able to breathe long on my own, they rolled me out into my bed. And it was a park uh, outside. There I was lying in the sun, it was getting fall, the leaves of the trees were getting colored. I felt life and the world was still a nice place. And then I looked up and there uh, in the neighboring building, there were windows and once in a while, it looked like a medical student. And they always would have, would give me strange looks. Well, I realized that they probably looked at me because they've heard, it was not a big clinic, that they had come a new patient. I felt I was different. That's when it started. It would become a horrible feeling afterwards and would bother me for a long time. But I also didn't have anybody to sort of push me. When my sister came, my husband, or my mom, they would push me a little bit around. And so I would be able to see it a little bit. I felt like an animal in the zoo, limited to you know, making the rounds being looked at by the visitors of the zoo. That's how I felt. You know, it's really strange. Once in a while, I sort of wake up and say, hey, can that be true that I've had polio now for some 60 years? Is that me? How, how come? How it has affected my life? What well, would I have been doing other things? Yeah, that's of course a very the topic for daydreams. Now, how high would I have jumped if I had had time to develop sort of a jumping career? Now, this kind of musing is uh, pretty useless because at the age of seventy-seven, people usually don't try and jump anymore. So a lot of these comparisons have dissolved with time. Before I got polio, I was working during the summer vacation as an assistant to surveyors. There was an airport close to where I was living to be constructed, and I was helping them out, and I would listen to them talking, and some of them said, oh yeah, yeah, I've heard about a colleague who's been surveying roads in Chile and they make good money there, and it's exciting, and talked about these things, and I thought, wow, that would be something. Because getting away from that small town where I grew up, where everybody knew each other, that, that would be exciting to get away, and especially in Latin America. As a matter of fact, I've had all this, since then cultivated an interest for Latin America. Now, would I have had that interest? Yeah. 
Would I have traveled to these places? Yeah, I did travel to these places. I found projects that helped me to get to Nicaragua and Costa Rica, where we stayed a year. And during that year, we adopted our daughter. So I was living and working in Costa Rica. Precisely what I loved to do before I became disabled. Spending five years between the age of 17 and 22 in a hospital affects you emotionally, but mostly it affects your social skills. It affects the way you look at yourself. I mean, it took me years to get over this, having to change pavements when I see somebody with a disability approaching me of not wanting to be associated with those guys. It took me years to overcome, which means that I was looking down on myself. And when I studied psychology, that was mainly an excuse of getting to know myself better. Some people say, I'm proud to be a crip. I'm proud to be a crip? No. No, it's, it's damn inconvenient to be a crip. But if I'm proud, then that I've been fighting for disability rights, fighting for a good cause, not taking it sitting down, so to speak.